Did you know you can watch a life-giving kids service each week? Go to lifechurchgreenbay.com slash kids where your kids can learn about Jesus in a fun, uplifting way. New episodes release every Friday for you to watch and discuss. Make kids service a part of your kids' watching lineup. Summer is coming, and that means getting outdoors. Before you head on out, head online to set up a recurring gift. Your ongoing gift makes so much possible. We produce live services and generate fresh online resources and experiences. Recurring gifts also allow us to continue to support local and international missions that count on the support from Life Church. Online giving is safe, simple, and secure. So set it and forget it. Make summer simpler by setting up a recurring gift today. The oldest story ever told is the one of father and son. Before the universe was created, father and son existed. There's a part of our soul longing for relationship with the father. Without that relationship, we become disconnected. Dysfunction grows and only transfers to the next generation if nothing changes. Hi, I'm Barry, the founder and host of Father Seekers. And I've often said, if you don't know, you just don't know. Well, it's the same with fatherless fathers. We know something's missing. And I say we because I grew up fatherless as well, missing that father connection. But I was able to rebuild the foundation and I believe you can do the same. We're in this together. Rebuild the foundations with Father Seekers. And if you have any questions or wanna dig deeper, go to fatherseekers.org. Hello friends, welcome to Life Church. If you're local, you need to come home. You need to be in our De Pere building. If you're from the 920, we've been back since January and we hope everybody knows that, but join us in person. We just had a worship night in the building and it was so special and I love that we're gathering again. If you're beyond the 920, thanks for being a part of our family too. And actually this past week I talked about how some people are so unfamiliar with tithes that I've had some people say, oh, where do I give my tithes? And, and I realized, because one person put it in writing, they spelled it T-I-D-E-S, like the water tides, or like the detergent, I guess. And I said, oh, oh, no wonder so many people can wonder what tithing really is about when they're not even sure really how we're spelling it. And listen, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, not just the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus said, continue to give your tithes. He knew people knew to give their tithes. And he said, because in the storehouse, in the place where the word of God is going out, there has to be something to keep it sustained. And so thank you for giving your tithes and your offerings and even those who are outside of the 920, you know that when you give to where you're spiritually fed, it allows us to continue to reach the 920 and beyond, other countries even. So thank you for being a part of helping people in need and other ministries in need, nonprofits, human beings in need, but thank you for letting us extend this message everywhere because you're faithful to tithes and offerings. And ultimately, this benefits the giver more than anyone. Because Sean and I give our tithes and our offering, God blesses us, God protects us, God is with us because we live the full Jesus life. So thanks for being a part of that with us. We love you and enjoy the rest of the service. Freedom. The power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Today we celebrate America. We celebrate our independence and our freedom. But as we all know, freedom isn't free. Men and women for centuries have been fighting and giving their lives for our freedoms. Freedoms that we often take for granted So today, let's intentionally celebrate the things we get to do. We get to be in church. We get to wake up and go to work and provide for our families. We get to listen to any music we like and watch any television shows we want. We have clean water and food at our disposal. This 4th of July, let's celebrate our independence as a nation and as a church, let's declare our dependence on God.
Hey friends, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. If you're not in a place where you have access to a traditional Bible, you can open up the YouVersion app, or it's also called the Bible app, and all the notes and scriptures, those have already been uploaded. Wherever it is that you're watching us from, I love you, and I am so grateful that you are a part of our family. Guys, happy Independence Day. Like, I'm so excited that it's on a Sunday this year. I love that I get to honor the members of our armed forces today. Any of you who know me, you know that I love Independence Day. And it's not just because I love the fireworks or the cookouts. I love Independence Day because I am a patriot. And I'm a patriot because I'm not an American by birth. I'm an American by choice. I was born in Canada, but I came to the U.S. for college, and I fell in love with this nation and its, its idea of the tireless pursuit of liberty and justice for all. And so I just stayed, and y'all aren't ever getting rid of me. <laughs> and so as an import, I am keenly aware of the great privilege it is to live in this great nation, which wouldn't be possible without the brave men and women who are serving and who've previously served and fought to secure and defend our freedoms. So if you are, or if you've ever been a member of any branch of our armed services, I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the power and right to act, speak, and think the way that I want without hindrance or restraint, for allowing me to go to work and provide for my family, for allowing me to be in church to worship in spirit and in truth without the fear of consequences. You are my heroes. And I love you from the bottom of my heart. I wanna share a message today that's one of the rare messages that's not part of a series. I wanna to talk to you today about living in the in-between. Let's pray. God, we love you, we honor you. Thank you for our independence. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the ultimate price that was paid by you on Calvary. So I pray for my friends who are watching this, that their hearts and their minds would be changed, that when we finish this, we'll be less like us and more like you, that we will live in our spiritual freedoms. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so next Sunday, I have this really cool opportunity to speak at one of my favorite churches, Bayside Church in California. They called me a few months ago and they asked if I would come and speak inside their series on the Gospel of Mark. And they asked me actually to speak on Mark 14. And I thought, you know, I wanna give this message to our people before I give it to their people. <laughs> so here we go, Mark 14. What a great chapter to have been tasked with. There's so much going on inside of it. Jesus is anointed at Bethany. You have the Last Supper. Jesus predicting Peter's denial. Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus being arrested. Uh, Jesus before the Sanhedrin, uh, and of course you have Peter denying and disowning Jesus. And so I thought, how do I narrow that down? What does God want me to talk about for the next 30 minutes or so? Well, uh, I thought, well, why don't I talk about context? Having the right context is critical. A couple of weeks ago, I took my son Isaiah to a football camp in Fargo, North Dakota. He got invited to the North Dakota State University camp, and it's a big deal. Like, he's worked his whole life to get to this, and, and I'm a really brand loyal guy, and so, like, I only fly Delta. I only rent cars through Hertz, and I try to only stay at Marriott hotels, and so naturally, I, I booked a room at the only Marriott that was available in Fargo, and I, I booked to have two beds, and uh, it's about a 500-mile drive, and so we we got about 100 miles away, we stopped for fuel, and I, I went on the app while we were stopped, and I checked in to the hotel, but I noticed that they had me in a king room rather than in a room with two beds, and so I, I just sent a little message to the hotel, and I it just explained that I was supposed to be in a two-bed bedroom, and instead I got put in one, so could they fix that before I arrived? And so they messaged me back, said, no problem, I've changed it all the way through your stay, and uh, I thought, great, this is perfect. About 30 minutes down the road, my phone rang. It was a 701 North Dakota number. I picked up the phone and the front desk attendant said, oh, I, I need to apologize because uh, we had a large group that just checked in and so I'm gonna need to bump you out of the room that you were in and I'm gonna need to put you in a room that has a king bed and a pull-out sofa. So I kind of rolled with it. I thought, no problem. I'd put Isaiah on the king bed. He needed the better night's sleep. I wasn't competing at the camp the next day. Um, so we got to the hotel and uh, things just went sour from there. 
She uh, not only had bumped me from my room, but when she has gave me my keys, I, I went up, the key didn't work, this has happened to everybody, I had to go back down, reprogrammed it, went up, key didn't work, had to go back down, reprogrammed it, had to go back up. There was people doing, you know, drugs. I could tell down the hall, I didn't want to leave my teenage son up in the hallway alone. It was kind of a wreck. So the third time finally got up, the key worked, we went in. The air conditioning didn't work. You pull out sofa, the springs were broken. It basically made you like, you know, a taco. And there was no sheets for the pull-out bed. There were no pillows for the pull-out beds. I had to go to Walmart. There's no, again, no AC. I had to go to Walmart. I had to buy a foam thing to go on the mattress. I had to buy fans for in the room. I had to buy sheets. I had to buy a pillow. I just rolled with it. This is important to my son. I didn't even say anything. So the next day, I took him to the camp, and while he was on his dinner break, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go back, and uh, I'm going to freshen up and uh, maybe lay down for an hour or so. So I get back to my room at 5.38 p.m. and I walk in and the room hadn't been cleaned. Now I have a teenage son, he uses every towel when he takes a shower. And so there were no towels, again, no air conditioning. It was just, I, I just really needed, the, I had no shampoo left. I mean, I used it on my beard. So I went downstairs, a different lady at the front desk. And I've learned in all of my travels, it never pays to be rude. And, and so uh, I also like to use people's first name. And so I, I looked at her tag and I said, Brittany, um, uh, I'm uh, Sean Hennessy. I'm in room 313. And my, my room uh, didn't get cleaned. And I, I want to know, number one, if it's going to get cleaned later or uh, can it get cleaned now? I don't have any towels. Or, and she goes, we only clean our rooms every five days. I said, um, like it was such finality. I said, okay would it be possible to, to get my room cleaned? She goes, she, she goes, there's a sheet up here that says we only clean the rooms every five days. I said, okay. I said, uh, when I smack my teeth, my kids know that I'm like, I'm like, Bruh. I said, okay. Uh, is it possible to speak to the manager? She said, Man, she's not here. I said, how would I possibly get a hold of the manager if I wanted to perhaps get a hold of her later. And she, she just so dismissively, she pointed out a business card. Now, now by this point, I knew I wasn't going to fix Brittany, but I thought maybe I could salvage some points out of this deal for a future stay. And so I took the card of the manager and, uh, and I turned around to walk away and I said, okay, well, thanks. I'm going to go up and I'm going to, I'm going to email her now. Two steps. She says, Go for it. Now, I'm a Christian, but I'm also a, a guy. And I just turned back around and I said, you know what, Brittany? Uh, I haven't been ugly with you. I haven't been sideways, haven't been rude. Everything's been wrong since I got here. I've been more than pleasant, more than accommodating, even though I have stayed 47 nights at Marriott's this year, even though I am the, you know, and yeah, I was maybe a, a, a little bit trying to pull the status thing, even though I'm like the top level of the uh, Marriott rewards. I said, let me just tell you, uh, when you have someone who, who has an option to stay at any hotel ever, anywhere, and they choose to stay at your hotel, I mean, you shouldn't be rude to anybody, but those are the people who you really shouldn't be rude to. And I turned around and uh, went to walk away and I got almost all the way to the elevator. And Brittany yells, sorry that we didn't have the room that you wanted. Sorry that our hotel is full. Sorry you're unhappy, Mr. Platinum. I turned around. Now, I didn't turn around. Let me correct that. I, I was standing at the elevator and I responded, see, Brittany, this is what I'm talking about. Just don't. Don't talk to me like that. Don't, you didn't have to, you didn't have to say anything. You didn't have to be rude to me at all. And she literally yelled at the top of her lungs, sir, you need to stop right now. I was like, really? I feel a little intimidated right now. So I just got in the elevator, went upstairs, got the rest of my stuff, came down, went to the field. And then I got an email on my phone from Marriott checking me out of my room, which I still was supposed to be in for the next three days. And I thought, this is weird. So I, I called the Marriott number and they assured me, no, you have a reservation for four days. I thought maybe I had wrongly booked just for one day. 
And while I was on the phone with Marriott, a phone, came, a phone number came through my voicemail and it was a 701 number. So I checked the voicemail and it was Brittany from the front desk. She said, I don't feel comfortable or safe with you staying in my hotel. I need you to leave. I didn't, I didn't even understand what was going on, y'all. So I called her back and she said, she said, sir, I'm going to need you to leave the hotel. I've already deactivated your keys and I'm going to need you to have a police escort out of here. I wish I was lying. Guys, at 9.30 at night, I drove back to the Fairfield Inn in Fargo, North Dakota. And with my son in the car, I got met by two Fargo police officers. They walked me up to my room. They watched me pack everything, put it on the cart. I had to walk down through a lobby filled with people who were now gawking. I'm sure some of them were filming it, thinking this dude's going to freak out. And I went to my car. I loaded it up. And as I was walking out, I looked at Brittany. I said, I don't even understand what's going on right now. Here's what she said to me. When I looked at you, I didn't know what you were capable of. Not when I had a conversation with you. Not when I interacted with you. When I looked at you. She looked at me with the shaved head and the long beard and the two kind of half sleeve tattoos that were showing through my t-shirt, and maybe I'm a little more burly than she anticipated I would be. She looked at me and she formed her own context of how I was going to respond. And so guys, context is critical, not just when dealing with Brittany at the Fairfield Inn in Fargo, but it's really critical when it comes to how you process the scriptures. So over the past five years, that's become one of my biggest passions because for the first 20 years of my Jesus journey, I was a point and pick guy. You know, where you, where you just flip your Bible open to wherever it falls and then you tell God to tell you something. Or I was a concordance Christian. Whatever it was that I was going through or dealing with in that moment, I'd look it up in my Strong's Concordance and then I'd read the scriptures that related to that topic until I found something that I liked. And it was shallow. It was such a surface search. And you know what? Surface scripture is fine as long as you've only got surface problems. But the deeper your problems, the deeper you need to go into the scriptures. And so context is king in any story, but especially in the story. It's key in how you view your situation and your surroundings, the scriptures and the Savior. And context isn't how we read something and apply it to our culture. It's asking ourselves, how did they hear it? What did they understand? What did they not understand? What was made clear to them in this story? What did they learn? For example, and some of you have heard me talk about this, but when Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, it wasn't a story that he had come up with. It was a story that they all would have already known. It was an old Jewish story called the story of the lost son. And in the original telling of it, just like in Jesus' telling of it, the son rebels, the son leaves, the son comes to himself, and the son returns. But in the original telling of it, the father doesn't welcome the son back. He denies him, doesn't let him return. Because the original meaning, the original context of the story of the lost son was a story of loyalty. It was a lesson that no one is more important than the community, not even your own son. So when Jesus begins to tell the story, everyone listening would have rolled their eyes like, yeah, yeah, we get it, the story of the lost son. We've heard this a thousand times. So when Jesus gets to the place where the father receives the son back, the listeners would have freaked out like, what? How dare you change our story? Sacrilege! <laughs> that Jesus did this all the time in his parables. He told stories they'd have already known with a new twist, with a new spin on them. Like, why do you think people were always trying to stone him or throw him off cliffs when he told his stories? In fact, my friend Matt Rosenberg, the rabbi from Seattle who who I worked through this message with, wrote a book called Jesus Never Said Anything New. And it is mind-bending. You can find it on Amazon. I promise you, it's, it's worth your time. So in his parables, Jesus was constantly changing the context, constantly asking himself, what's clear to them in this story? Or what is it that they need to learn? So context isn't about reading something and applying it to our culture. But the problem is, that's how I would constantly read the Bible for the first 20 years 
of my Christian walk. I read it within the context of where I grew up. Again, born in Canada, raised in the inner city, my whole world was small. It was narrow. So the people and the places in the story looked like the people and the places in my story. Or I always inserted myself into their story, like I was the hero. And I think a lot of us do that. Like the whole book was written as an instruction manual to get us into heaven or keep us out of hell. But then I went to Israel. And when I went to Israel, everything changed. I mean, I floated in the Dead Sea. I saw the caves in, in En Gedi where David had hid. I stood among the shambles of the streets of Bethsaida, the hometown of three of Jesus' 12 disciples. I saw an olive press in Jesus' childhood hometown of Nazareth. I stood on the Mount of Olives, prayed in the holy city, and sat in the garden where Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount and gave us the Beatitudes. I walked the Via Della Rosa, and I sailed on the Sea of Galilee. And I think that the Sea of Galilee changed my perspective more than anything. I mean, it brought so many stories into context. So much of Jesus' ministry took place near that spot, and I was struck by the size of it. I'd always pictured it like it was Lake Michigan, the ocean of the Midwest, but I couldn't believe how you can literally see across it. I mean, it's not like Lake Michigan at all. It's more like Lake Winnebago. And that made me wonder what else I was seeing wrong. While I was in Nazareth, I, I came across the writings of a guy named Kenneth E. Bailey, who was a doctor of theology who not only taught in Middle Eastern universities, but lived inside these Middle Eastern villages to see how the Bible was constructed from their point of view. And when I read his writings, everything really changed. I discovered that I was reading a Middle Eastern book through Western eyes. So I began to search. I began to dig. I wanted to excavate the scriptures, go past the topsoil, through the subsoil, and get to the bedrock. And so when I received my assignment on Mark 14, I thought, what's beneath the surface that God's looking to unearth for you and to unearth for me? What's the nugget? What artifact has been hiding that I hadn't seen before? What can I help you put into your pocket and carry around to pull out during the week when you need it? Like my wife, Pastor Sonny, says that there are people who are pocket people. There are people that are so kind, that are so life-giving, that you want to just put them in your pocket and carry them around so you can pull them out and harvest their joy in the moments when you need it. Like my friend, Pastor Scott, who does our downtown campus and teaches growth, track, he's a pocket person to me. And so the thing that struck me in Mark chapter 14 was Jesus' prayer in verse 36, where he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, what you will. Of course, this is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane where he was under such stress that he's literally sweating drops of blood. But what's interesting is that he was praying this right after the Last Supper where he and his disciples were celebrating Passover. And the Passover is an interesting thing. The Jewish people have been celebrating it every year for over 3,000 years. And it is a party. You have never been to a party. You think you've been to a party? You've never been to a party until you have been to a Passover celebration in Jerusalem. It is lit guys like man i wish i could describe it more to you but the time that i went they were drinking the wine and they were singing and then this dude tried to hand me this pipe that i thought i didn't know what was in the pipe i didn't smoke what was in the pipe but he was smoking what was in the pipe and he he was live i'm just saying that passover was a party and Jesus and his disciples would have taken part in it every year of their lives. And, and that's so relevant to Independence Day because it's a meal to celebrate their freedom. The whole context of the Passover is death and deliverance, just like Independence Day. And in the Passover Seder or in the Passover order, there are four cups, which, which that just lets you know that it's a party. Four cups of wine? Come on, somebody. I mean, it's really one cup that's filled four times. And Pastor Chris Hodges from... Birmingham, Alabama wrote a great book about it called The Four Cups. So you have the cup of sanctification, the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, and the cup of praise. And those four cups, they come from the four promises God makes with his people in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. And it is four 
I will statements. He says, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and I will take you as my people. And every year of their lives to that point, Jesus and the disciples would have drank those four cups. And this year started like any other year. Before the meal began, as they were entering the house, a cup of wine, the cup of sanctification would have been served as the blood of the lamb was being spread on the doorposts as directed in Exodus chapter 12. Then appetizers would be served as the preparation of the meal was being completed. And since this meal was being served in an upper room this year, the door was likely downstairs. So this cup was probably consumed before they ever even entered the upper room. Then when they sat at the table, Three pieces of unleavened bread would have been wrapped together and would have been laid before them. And, and the middle, what's called the matzah, would have been removed, it would have been broken, and it would have been eaten. Then as a part of the Seder, it's the privilege of a child to ask the father why this night and meal is so different from all other nights and meals. Like, why is it that on this night we only eat the matzah? And it's at that point that the father has the opportunity to tell the story of the deliverance of the Jewish people from their bondage in Egypt. And then they drink the cup of deliverance. Now, having no mention of a child in the upper room, uh, to be able to ask the question, that might explain why John, the youngest of the disciples, was seated next to Jesus in what's called the good seat. Perhaps, perhaps he was given the assignment of asking the question, of Jesus. And, and so while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when they had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it, the cup of deliverance. And the gospel of Luke says that after the meal, Jesus took the third cup, the cup of redemption. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my body, which is poured out for you. And this is the only place that Jesus is ever recorded as saying the new covenant. And in fact, the only other place that the new covenant is even mentioned is in Jeremiah 31. So when Jesus says that, these dudes would have known that it was from Jeremiah, where Jeremiah said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their fathers, but instead I'm going to write it on their hearts and I'm going to put it in their minds. And so then Jesus takes a turn, a, a shift, and rather than serve the fourth cup, the cup of praise, he says, I tell you, I will never drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus does something that had never been done before. He ends the Seder with the third cup. He doesn't drink of the fourth cup. He doesn't drink of the cup of praise. And the idea is this, that Jesus paused the Passover. And he paused it because he wasn't going to drink of that cup until he returns as predicted in Revelation and he drinks it at the marriage supper of the Lamb. When he says, I'll come back, I'll retrieve you, and we can finish the Seder that I started with the disciples at the Last Supper. So right now, you and I are stuck between the redemption and the praise. So we have to look back on our redemption and look forward to our praise. We have to look back on the things that he's done before, knowing that he's going to do them again. And the disciples did that. It's so dope. Even though they didn't drink of the cup of praise, verse 26 says that they still sang the psalms of praise. And they did that before they ever went to the Mount of Olives. Like in Passover, as a declaration of it is finished, after the fourth cup, they all would sing the Hallel, the 113th through 118th Psalm. And all of those Psalms tell of what happens when the Messiah returns. So, so when the disciples sing the Hallel, it's a declaration of faith. It's them saying that they take Jesus at his word. So after the third cup, the cup of redemption, Jesus goes to the garden and he agonizes. He sweats blood and he prays and his prayer is so personal. We know that because when he's referring to his father, rather than using the word avinu, which, which means father in the formal sense and was how all Jews referred to God as in avino makinu, our father and our king, Jesus uses a word man wasn't supposed to use when referencing God. He says the word Abba, 
It's the Hebrew word for dad or daddy. So he says, Abba, Father, or Dad, everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And that cup in that prayer is the cup that he had just received with his disciples in the upper room. It was the cup of redemption. It was Jesus saying, Dad, isn't there another way? I know that there needs to be a lamb sacrificed for them, but do I really have to be tortured? Do I really have to be ridiculed? Do I really have to be beaten and bruised? Do I really have to die for this? But nevertheless, your will be done. Not long after he prays that prayer, he's seized and he's brought before the Sanhedrin. And, and the high priest asks him these words, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus again changes the context. He says, I am. <laughs> but it's not I am like if I asked you if you're who you are. It's a reference to when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and told him to deliver a message to Pharaoh and the children of Israel. And when Moses asked God, if the children of Israel ask me who you are, what should I tell them? And God said, you tell them I am that I am. But contrary to what we read in the English version, Moses couldn't possibly have said that to them because he couldn't have spoken of God in the first person. That was blasphemy. It was punishable by death. If he would have that, they would have torn his clothes and murdered him. So when he relayed the message to them, he would have said, he is that he is. But that's not what Jesus says here. He actually says, I am that I am. And in referencing God in the first person, he is declaring himself God. And when Jesus says that, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. And he tore his clothes because he wouldn't recognize Jesus as God. And 2,000 years later, we are still indicting the high priest because he wouldn't recognize Jesus as God, when in actuality, we've been tearing our clothes all our lives too. And we've been tearing our clothes because we won't acknowledge Jesus as God over certain areas of our lives. We don't wanna recognize him as God over our money or our marriage, our kids or our career. I mean, I wonder, what, what have you not been letting Jesus be God over in your life? I mean, what's the context of your life? I mean, you're not a physical being living in a spiritual world. You're a spiritual being living in a physical world. You're living in the in-between. So why are you prioritizing physical things and trying to fit your spirituality into them? When you should be prioritizing spiritual things and making your physical existence fit within them. We need to be looking back at our redemption and looking forward to our praise. Like, don't look back on the struggles you've had in your marriage. Look forward to the bliss that you're gonna have. Don't look back on the struggles that you've had in your finances. Look forward to the blessings that you're gonna live in. Don't look back on the struggles that you've had with your kids. Look forward to the battles that they're gonna win. Don't look back on the failures that you've had. Look forward to the victories that are yet to come that are promised because you serve the God of the in-between who said he'll never leave you nor forsake you, who's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, who when you walk through the waters, he will be there, who when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death will be there, whose rod and staff will comfort you, whose mercy will follow you all the days of your life, who is the same yesterday today and forever. And so don't muddle in the middle. Let Jesus change the context of your life. Get ready to drink the cup of praise because he said, I will take you as my people. So I wonder, will you do that? Will you do it today? Would you close your eyes? You know, salvation is acknowledging this thought that you need to receive the cup of praise. I wonder if you've done that. Have you ever received your cup of praise? Have you ever surrendered yourself? Have you ever looked past the redemption that you've received and looked forward to the praise that you need to give? I wanna give you the opportunity to do that today. It's said in scriptures that when one person comes to the kingdom, a celebration breaks out in heaven. They praise the king. And so today, I want to give you the opportunity 
to start a party in heaven. It's very simple. It's not easy, but it is very simple to do. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and believe that Jesus can change that, you will be saved. And so today, if that's you, I'm gonna say a few lines in a prayer, and if you repeat those after me and you mean them in your heart, the Bible says that you will be saved. So we say this after we say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you change me? Will you come into my life, make me different, make me new, be my Lord, be my Savior, in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. We're so excited that you have now become a part of our family, God's family. And so we would love the opportunity to connect with you. Uh, would you just reach out to us and let us know? Send us a message so that we can pray for you and so that we can connect with you. But we're not done. Maybe you're a Jesus guy uh, or you're a Jesus girl and you say, Sean, I haven't been living in the in-between. You've been dwelling in it, but you haven't been living. You haven't been thriving. If that's you, I want to pray for you. So God, today for my friends who haven't been living in the in-between, give them mercy, give them hope, give them strength. In Jesus' name, amen.
This moment doesn't have to end now. The things you are thinking about, you're questioning, you're mauling over right now, have a conversation with someone. Call someone up and talk about this. Or if you're with someone right now, you could go to lifechurchgreenbay.com or text discussion to 97000. There you can download discussion questions to prompt even more. And if you'd rather listen, try out the Chew On That podcast, where Pastor Scott and a guest talk every week about this very message. You'll find these discussion questions you download will help you with whether you're new to Jesus or you've known Jesus for decades. Either way, they will help you on your Jesus journey.